Thank you for the invitation, and, and uh, this is the kind of group I enjoy <laughs> talking to because it's a mix of scientists and students, uh, coaches, athletes, and, and uh, I think this is where the new ideas develop. Now, whether you're, whichever side you're coming from, coach, athlete, scientist, you kind of are, you're interested in this process. You're interested in generating a training stimulus. And you expect that training stimulus to affect the brain, affect the heart, affect the muscles in different ways, uh, and hopefully lead to a, a positive adaptation. And if it was so simple, that we would probably wouldn't be here. But unfortunately, when we train, there is stress. We, we do damage. We stress the body in different ways. And so the whole process is about finding the balance between the adaptive signal and the, the, the negative complications of the stress that training imposes. So now if I prescribe one training session, I can pretty much do whatever I want. I can choose some combination, you know, I find a training mode and then manipulate duration and intensity in different ways and I would argue there are essentially no toxic training intensities or combinations. Now, CrossFit MRF may lead to rhabdomyolysis, but that's another topic. Uh, generally, one training session, you can do whatever you want. But then, when we now already, if we move to a week of training, now, we're, now we have to start thinking about balancing some different agendas. We have to balance load and volume in a way that we don't overstress the athlete because. There is data to suggest that there are toxic distributions of training intensity over time. I use that word toxic in a, a broad sense, that they can potentially re result in overreaching or other complications. Now, if we extend it out to 12 weeks, let's start talking about periodization. Now we're going to plan a cycle. And you don't have to look very hard on the internet to find some tremendously complex, exciting uh, <coughs> plans for how you're going to build the capacity of the athlete, mobilize and peak at exactly the right day. Problem is, it doesn't take much to mess up a brilliant periodization plan. And we're going to look at some of this real data from real athletes to try to detect how much brilliant periodization is really going on. We call this the butterfly effect. I don't know if you're familiar with that in chaos theory. Small changes can result in big downstream effects. So, how much control do we have? How much predictive value or predictive control do we have over the basic training outcome at the individual level? And what are the sources of variability or control? Now, this is where I've been for 15 years, trying to just look at some generalizable effects that are associated with the basic framework of intensity and volume distribution across sports and as a group at the population level. And I think after 15 years, I think we have sufficient data, both observational and experimental, to suggest there is a, a substantial effect of getting that distribution reasonably correct. If we go a step up the ladder, then we can say, well, what about, is there a generalizable effect associated with the periodization of the model? Now, what does that word mean specifically? I would say periodization implies ordered application of stimulus. There is an order implicit in periodization models that if we do this first, whether it's higher volume and we increase the intensity, that there is something about the order of the application that results in a better outcome than if we didn't have that order. Okay? So that's what's kind of implicit in the idea of periodization. If you take that away, then all it is is variation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to look at some research. But I, my hunch so far is that the effects are actually smaller than the hype. 
And then, there's individual variation. This is where things get really tricky. That even if we do a best practice model as we understand it today, we know that athletes don't all respond the same way. You guys know that better than most. So my, I'm curious how much of that individual variation is potentially, let's call it correctable. It would be responsive to an optimization strategy. No, sorry. This 80-20 polarized model doesn't work for you, but 60-40 does. If, you know, if we had a way to figure that out, how much of that variation can be corrected? And then how much of it is that part of this whole equation that really is not much fun at all? And that's, well, sorry, it's genetic. You're just not a very good responder. Find something else to do. And we suspect that part of the, part of the variability is up in that box, but hopefully not so much that, that it's not fun for us as sports scientists. So that's the way I kind of categorize the, the variability, just as a, as a way of thinking right now. Now, I'm not going to talk about the whole story of the polarized, this 80-20 polarized business, but I will share with you a little bit. I don't think I would have gotten into this business if I hadn't moved to Norway. Before I moved to Norway, I was doing isolated heart perfusions on rats. I was studying oxidative stress. I killed a lot of hearts or a lot of rats in the interest of science. Uh, I, I was doing very basic biochemistry type things. But then I was in a lab where Lance Armstrong was being tested and we were doing heat studies for the military. And so I was influenced and I was training and, and I was interested in you know the, the old fashioned exercise physiology that got me started in the first place. When I moved to Norway, I went back there to human research. And when I moved to Norway, I, I had some, in, some things happen. This was in the mid-90s. One thing happened, I'm out in the forest, and in, in Norway there's a lot of forest, and there were a lot of cross-country skiers and, dis, and endurance athletes in general. And I, discuss, I saw a young woman with I already knew had a VO2 max of about 65, 67 mLs per kg, which is not bad. And she was running along and she came to a hill and she stopped running and walked fast up the hill. And I said, well, what the heck are you doing? No pain, no gain, you know? But it turned out she had a very clear idea of what she was doing. Because that day, she was, her goal was to have a low intensity session. She wanted to keep her intensity down. So she was, she had discipline. She had intensity discipline, as I came to call it, or have it in my head. And that, that influenced my thinking. And then a national team coach at the time in, in Norway who was coaching the gladiators of cross-country skiing in the late 90s, Bjorn Daly with eight gold medals and Thomas Aldsgård, these were big names in Scandinavia and in the world of skiing with VO2s that are kind of legendary. He said, training at the lactate threshold is too much effort for too little gain. And I said, what? What are you talking about? The basic model is to go find your lactate threshold and train a lot there. And this, this guy who was coaching <laughs> legendary athletes that were kicking butt said, no, that's not what we do. So that was interesting to me. It went against my understanding. And then I was asked to review a paper by Veronique Bilal around 2000. It got published in 2001. She was studying Kenyan uh, marathoners. And I reviewed it. She was very focused on the high intensity component, and that was what she was doing a lot of research on. And but I said, well, but look at the overall distribution of training. Turns out these marathoners were not training at marathon intensity very much at all. And so I convinced her to put that data in the paper, and and then that that data got me to thinking even more about hmm, what what is the real you know how do elite athletes actually train. And so these were three kind of, if I look back, three important uh, steps that ultimately led to quite a bit of research. And then we did retrospective work on uh, gold, uh, metal winning rowers over 30 years to see how their training had changed. 2004, we published this. And, and there is kind of the first, thing, first time I, I, in print, had used the term polarized training. And I also used what essentially was this 80-20 distribution concept. So both of those were there. I'd kind of been talking about them at places before that, but I didn't have the data. So this was, this was the first. And then we did another study 
where we observed really good cross-country skiers, we calculated their training, and, and we started to see again this, this distribution. So at that point, we went out and said, hey, we think maybe uh, elite, you know, highly trained athletes, this is, this is kind of an appropriate uh, distribution. And this, this picture got uh, printed. So it kind of put, put these two. If I were going to draw it today, I'd probably draw it differently. But it created a kind of a dichotomy or a, or a, a testable paradigm for people to go in and say, OK, let's, let's see if, if there's any sense to what uh, is being presented here. Since then, it's been a lot of work. I made this so that every one of these is linkable. So if we put this presentation out, then, then you guys can then find every single paper uh, that's, that's here. And there are others, but this is a fairly good chunk of, of the experimental, the, the observational, the methodological studies that have been connected to, to me and, and others uh, that I think supports the basic, I, the basic distribution that Matt Fitzgerald wrote about last year. He wrote a book called 80-20 Running. He, contacted me and and it was flattering to, to get you know to find out you're going to have a book written about what you've done and I I'm not going to you know, I'll admit it I counted how many times he, he put my name <laughs> in the book I did I counted 45 times it may have been more so but there were also other people involved in this book he he, he, he you know it's popular science uh, you, you, you do some things you, you write as a journalist a little differently than you write as a scientist but he kind of encapsulated uh, some the basic story of some work I had done over 15 years. And so pretty much you feel like at that point, well, you need to move on. And the, the foreword in the book, this is what it said from a guy. I don't really know him, but he has some website. He says, do 80% of you running at low intensity and the remaining 20% at moderate to high intensity? The rest is details. So that's my career wrapped up, or at least 15 years wrapped up in a sense. So at that point you feel like, that doesn't seem very hard. Uh, and then once you get a, one of these graphics done on your work, that also tells you it's time to move on, uh, as, as uh, Romain talked about. And so uh, Lemur has also summarized all this work in this way. And I think it's, it's basically straight out of lectures I've given, so I have nothing against it. So that's a platform. But I think I want to talk about the details since that's <laughs> some of the details at least. So one of the details that I want to talk about, and, and let, me, let me back up just one second. If the 80-20 distribution is wrong, and maybe it, it, please as students attack it, attack, you know, attack these underlying assumptions, we should always do that. But you're gonna be the ones that'll attack it and break it down and, and find the flaws, probably not me, because I've been doing this too long. It's, it's, you'll need, it'll need fresh eyes uh, to, to reevaluate these kinds of things. And that happens sometimes. So don't, I don't want you to interpret what I'm saying now and say, I, I know this is right. But I'm saying, this is, I've done what I, it's right enough for me that I want to look at other things. And I encourage others to attack these paradigms because they need to always be under uh, question. But I want to go back to something that already was presented, I think, in a very meaningful way in the 60s by Ostrom. If you don't have the textbook of work physiology, I encourage you. It's a classic book. It's worthy of being in your library. And Per Ostrom, as he looked in 63, he was already bald, <laughs> so he looked the same for 50 years. But he said this. He said, it's an important but unsolved question. Which type of training is most effective? Maintain a level re representing 90% of the VO2 max for 40 minutes or hold 100% for 16 minutes? Now there's a lot of implicit information there. Okay, number one, he's suggesting, hey, there is an interaction between intensity and duration, intensity and accumulated work time that may be important in, in, in the signaling process. And number two, he said it's not linear. In other words, just a, a reasonably small reduction in intensity results in a big increase in accumulated duration. 
as he implied with the numbers he chose. And everything we know from the way athletes train suggests that, of course, he's right. He was right. And so if you, this is, I would even suggest maybe based on our recent research, this is even steeper than what I show here. But if I get this to work, got to point it the right way. Yeah. There we go. So what I'm saying here is that in the, in the high intensity zone, what we see is, is that very small variability or variation in this intensity range results in big differences in the, what I call the tolerable accumulated duration. So for example, six times 10 minutes at 90% of heart rate max, that's a, that's a tolerable workout for an elite rower or cross country skier. But if I go to 95%, then the tolerable accumulation goes way down, probably now down to maybe 20 minutes. So it's a very clearly nonlinear relationship. Now, based on earlier work, like if you have athletes do intervals, this is four minute intervals with either one, two, or four minute recovery we post. This is RPE. It increases linearly with each bout. Doesn't seem to really matter what the rest interval is within that range. And so you can kind of extrapolate some I'm cooked number of intervals, right? They might, if I had put $100 on the line, been able to do one or two more, but at some point they say, no moss, right? And that, that point will depend very, very sensitively on the specific intensity. Now, if we prescribe, this is, if we prescribe four times 16 minutes or four times eight, or four times four minutes where the accumulated durations are 64, 32, and 16 respectively. And if we tell them in each situation to do the session at maximal sustained intensity, in other words, over the course of the whole session, as hard as you can go, the, the, the session RPE ends up being essentially the same. Okay? So 16 minutes, you know, the, the, the density of suffering is, is higher for 16, the four times four, but they end up feeling the same 30 minutes after the workout. So we did a study uh, published in 13 where we wanted to look at this. What, what is the interactive effects or what are they, if any? And so we had four training groups. One group only trained low intensity. Another group trained twice a week, four times 16 minutes. Another group four times eight. And another group four times four. And again, we use what we call an effort matching model. I could spend a lot of time talking about, I think a lot of these work matching studies basically are useless for understanding high performance training, but that's another story. So here we based on effort, because that's what athletes do. And then we train them for eight weeks, twice a week in the lab, controlled everything, and then otherwise they only did low intensity sessions. And then these were the data, uh, VO2 peak, change is 95% confidence intervals, power at VO2 peak, power at four millimeter, millimeter, uh, millimolar lactate, and time to exhaustion 80%. Uh, we, we, didn't have, we didn't want to have to do a lot of familiarization trials, so that's why we use this particular test in this study. But all cases, the eight, four times eight tended to be better. Uh, and when we looked at the response distribution, it looked like this, that the, the four times eight group tended to get a better overall response. Now, does this mean that four times eight is magic, that it's the magic combination of intensity and duration? No, that's not what I want to say. But what I do want to say is it at least suggests that this interaction matters. And then when we looked at this compared to how all the observations we've done on, on some very successful athletes, it made sense because what we see that they tend to choose an intensity that is above MLSS but below the really high intensity. They, they find about that 90% intensity and they collect a lot of minutes. When I say they, I mean multiple time gold medal winners and rowing, cross country ski, running, that we saw a pattern that suggested that maybe the highest intensities are not uh, a place that the elite athletes go too often because the cost is quite high. 
This was repeated by another group, Sandbach, uh, in Norway. They looked at probably better trained athletes, junior cross-country skiers, compared uh, working at 94% heart rate versus 91, so it's a small difference. But the blood lactates are very different. It, it, it matters. And they also saw that the longer intervals gave a better effect in these well-trained athletes. Won't spend too much time here, but my PhD student, this is actually his training uh, in preparation for the Rotterdam Marathon. He's a pretty good, he's a 215 guy. Uh, and we were kind of starting to be interested in this concept of, of, uh, of developmental training sessions. So even over the entire spectrum of intensity and duration, we think that athletes try to, at times, have certain sessions that we would call them developmental, possibly because of their duration, 50 kilometers on asphalt, or their or their intensity, but they have a developmental or the, the expectation is that they should be uh, pushing the frontiers for the athlete. And so this is this is the session load score for every single workout during this <coughs> eight week period. And, and and there's a standard deviation, so this is typical and then you start to see, but there are certain sessions that are extreme. This is the marathon itself. So with warm-up time, 168 minutes, warm-up plus work, and RPE, session RPE, 10. So it was tough. So that's kind of your calibration point. So we, we're, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to work with this, but we think that uh, you can't just look at intensity. You have to look at that interaction. Now, another question, another detail is this issue of periodization. This is a periodization model. Highly defined structural sections, mesocycles. This is building a barn. Okay? It's a linear process. You need to do certain things first before you do the next thing. You need to build the foundation before you put up the scaffolding, for example. If you don't, totally wrong. Right? So this kind of a periodization model is logical and it works every time. This is a periodization model for training. It looks similar, and it kind of has some of the same, same assumptions. There's a linearity. There's a process. There's a, a, an ordered process. And if you do it all right, you achieve peak performance at the right time. Now, I think one of the, an article recently written by John Keeley was really nice in kind of attacking some of the underlying assumptions. Because all of us, I, I was in the Soviet Union back in the 80s, uh, learning about their periodization models. But the underlying assumptions and the, the evidence base for all this periodization work and literature is very thin to non-existent. And he, he, he laid that out pretty nicely. And I would strongly recommend you read that article. So, what do we know? Well. We recently published in PLUS ONE this study where we, we had data from 12 Olympic and world champions in skiing and uh, uh, biathlon. So this was a, an elite group. You had, they had to have a gold medal to get in the club. To be, to be, and they had to have annual data that was complete. Fortunately, in Norway, there's a pretty strong tradition for keeping training diaries. So Espen Tunnison, who works at the Olympic Federation, has developed methodology for digitizing all of this data, going from the paper, the traditional diaries, to uh, electronic methods. And now all the athletes have electronic uh, diaries uh, that are used. But what we saw was uh, that these great athletes who had been highly successful, when we, just, when we looked at the actual time in zone, it was not over 90% at sub, let's say, sub 2 millimolar blood lactate. Okay, that's a general, and, and it wasn't just at certain times. If we look at, a, this is a champion skier with 50 World Cup victories, and we look at her training periodization, to put it that way, this is total training hours. The typical model is, is when you get to about June, you ramp up your training, you collect a lot of hours, so basically a, at least 20 hours a week here for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months, 
and then comes competition season and you see a reduction in volume. If you look at the high intensity sessions, this is the number of high intensity sessions per month, it's flat. There's not a lot of fancy periodization going on here, folks. They're just doing a lot of work. And this is total training sessions. Again, very little evidence of tightly defined structural models, but a lot of work, consistent work. And then the one thing we t do see is once that season begins, volume goes down. What we're not sure is, is why? Is it because it should or because it has to? Because when you're in a World Cup season in cross-country skiing, you're competing essentially every weekend, traveling and so forth. So there's a big change in the stress load. Same thing, here's a champion rower, same thing. You just don't see a lot of variability. This is, this is uh, training sessions. This is training hours. You know, this guy loves to cross-country ski in January, so he just goes bananas, goes to Italy and skis, you know, 30 hours a week. Is it because of very pure periodization logic, or is it just chance? And so, and then it gets to the competition phase. This is the number of training hours. This is a gold medal year, 1,041 hours, almost 600 training sessions, average hours per week, 22, average number of sessions, 12.5, and not a lot of variation. Now, if you take that athlete and you just look at his high intensity component, you do see something that is, looks like a, a bit of periodization. And that is that the high intensity component of the training seems to start with mostly threshold work, and then as the competition period approaches, you start to see more of the zone four and zone five work. You see kind of a, an overall polarization of the intensity distribution. The hard sessions get harder. And actually the easy sessions get even easier. Same thing, this is a world champion, Ingrid Christensen, still one of the best times for the 10K ever. This is her preparation period. Here, this is again my typical color coding, zone one, two, three, four, and five. And this is what it looks like in the prep period. Intensity goes down, the comp or volume goes down in the competition period, but the overall distribution stays very similar. But there's a bit of an increase in the highest intensities and a bit of a decrease in the threshold. So there seems to be, within the big picture, a bit of a, a, a typical structure there. So, and, and then this is from the one more study, this is from the, the, the Road to Gold paper we published. You see that same tendency when you look at all 12 skiers. Flat volumes essentially here, uh, overall distribution stays the same, but the high intensity component shifts from more threshold to more uh, VO2 max training, you might say. So what did we do? We said, all right, let's, let's look at that. Let's develop an RCT and look at the actual periodization structure of the high intensity component because there are different theories around. So we started with, we recruited 70 cyclists initially or 69. We first did a four week in run with, or to, to stabilize their training and do some familiarization trials. Uh, so they were all training essentially the same way. Then we tested them, then we stratified them based on VO2 max and experience and, and age, randomized them to three groups. We had three different, this was a multi-center trial, and I, I think in elite sport performance research, that's probably where we have to go to get the sample sizes necessary to, to detect small differences. So we had three different universities in Norway uh, participating. And we trained them one of three ways. Uh, we called it a traditional periodization model. Uh, a reverse periodization model or a hybrid and what just here I just want to point out that you know these were not elite athletes but they were they were competitive cyclists with VO2 max in the low you know 61 on average they train 10 hours a week uh, and our sample sizes are are good okay 20 plus per group so once they were randomized, the intervention period lasted 12 weeks. It was divided into three mesocycles cycles of four weeks each. The traditional group trained, their high intensity work was in zone three, in, in cycle one, and then zone four, and then zone five. So they're increasing the intensity of the high intensity training. 
the hybrid model mixed these and the reverse model went the other direction. They started with zone five sessions and worked down. <coughs> it was balanced such that everyone was exposed to the exact same number of sessions, the same total uh, volume of high intensity work. The only difference was the order, okay, which is the periodization com component and an extensive post -tensive. So. It's a lot of data, about 250,000 data points in total because we have training data on every session they did. Uh, so it doesn't compare with Lewis Passfield's millions, but it's, there's a lot of data here. So I'm just going to show you some of the basic or the, the main findings so far. This is what it looked like overall for all the groups combined. They, we successfully achieved this periodization structure that kind of is out of the book where we do builds in each muscle cycle, then they have a down week. This is when they were tested. And this is the low intensity and the, uh, the higher intensity work. This is strength training and so forth. And when we looked at their uh, fatigue, it kind of follows the, the expected pattern, but they didn't fall apart. This was on the ragged edge of what they could do though. The three with the highest loads were three high intensity sessions per week. And that's tough. You know, when they're all together and they're all working, uh, they're, kind of, they're driven by each other. So it was at the edge of what they could do. Training characteristics. This is what it looks like in the different intensity zones when they did 4 times 16. When you give them this prescription, it just kind of moves them into a predictable area. They end up being about at their maximum lactate steady state. 5, 4, 4 to 5 millimolar. When you put them at 4 times 8, they end up at about... 8 to 10 millimolar. And then when you put them at 4 times 4, they get cooked. They, they're up there. And their RPEs now are actually 15, 16, 17. So there's something about RPE, even if you tell them to go all as hard as they can go, as hard as they can go for 64 minutes is a different RPE than for 16 minutes. The tolerable exertion, you might say. I'm sure you could talk about that, but we, we see consistent differences there. So here's the traditional group, what their volume periodization looked like for high intensity. Here's the hybrid group. So they were doing some of these, all three types of sessions, each mesocycle. And here's the reverse group, starting with zone five, hard, really hard, but low volumes, and then, and then stretching it out. So what do you think happened? Which, if you're the coach, which would you bet on? Who bets traditional? If you're the coach or you're the athlete, which one of these are you going to go for? Now, basic framework, 80-20, but the 20%, how do, you want to, how do you want to structure that? Do you want to start with a lot of threshold training and work your way up towards high intensity? Do you want to mix it? That makes sense, maybe? Or do you want to first build up your VO2 max with these high intensity intervals and then stretch your duration, which that's been called reverse periodization. How many? Give me a give me a traditional. But it depends where they start, though. Oh, okay, we'll get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to you don't get to qualify your answer yet. Traditional, hybrid, reversed. Okay. It depends. It depends. Yeah. So you you you're, you must be a scientist. So what do we see? Well. At, the, at one level, I can say, well, it doesn't matter. Because statistically, we didn't see clear differences. But if we look at the tendencies, here's the power at 40-minute uh, time trial, the, just the pure performance measure. It tended to be better in the traditional group. Power at VO2 max tended to be better in the traditional group. VO2 max improvement, so this is change tended to be better in the traditional group you know so all all the data they slid, the traditional periodization slid a little forward but it there's a lot of variability here and if i look at it this way where i where i categorize the the index performance change where i take the four main test variables can condense them and look at the responder responders being uh under 3% change, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, or 6 to 10, and 10 plus. This is traditional. This is hybrid. This is reverse. So 
not statistically significant. That's a point, you know, cross uh, a chi-square 0.2 p value. So from a scientific, you know, statistical point of view, we'd say no difference. But what, which one would you choose as a coach? 60% chance, you know, that you get a good effect out of the traditional model, maybe. So it's, my point is, is we tried to do everything we could to control the variables and really test this. And when we look carefully at the ordering effect, it's not very clear at all. It's a small, if there's an effect, it's small as long as I do the work. And this is what I'll end with. <laughs> this is the data behind the data. And this is where we've got to go. Every, every performance study or every training study needs to present their individual data because I think this is, this is where we're at. And you see, this, you see the distribution, folks. It's big. I mean, we... As best as we could, we built this on a best practice model. We, we controlled the variables. We, you know, they're highly motivated. <coughs> and look at the variability. And when we try to control for, you know, how they actually perform a session, sickness, and a, you get a maybe age, maybe years of experience, tiny, you know, a little bit of explained variability there, but you still have a lot. I think we're going to still end up with seeing a lot of this variability just is not clear, easily explained by differences in the subjects at the starting point. So that's where we're at. Uh, I think as students, that's where my challenge to you is, is moving forward towards 2025, uh, within moving beyond best practice and group-based group ideas. You know, as a scientist, we, this is what we do. We take all the individual responses, group them, and say, make some conclusion. As coaches, every athlete is a, is a case study. And if you get one athlete, if you've got a group of six athletes and one of them gets a gold medal, you're a star. Even if the other, even if four of them fell apart. Right? That's the way things work in the coaching game. So they're interested in the individual case studies. And then we have to figure out how to speak together. Thank you.